first place that we started our work five years ago when we started to look at this again is Kazakhstan and we were blown away by the lack of coverage. We are in a structural supply deficit of 50 odd million pounds. Just very quickly on SMRs, the reason they're a necessity is because you can't reach these nuclear ambitions in, by, by using traditional nuclear. The number one bottleneck in rolling these things out at scale is the lack of payload. Righto, Benny Fine Gold. Mate, it should be, it's, it, for, the, for the purpose of this chat, it's Benny Fine Uranium. What's going on, <laughs> mate? Good jumper. For the yellow cake only. <laughs> um, happy to be here with you boys. Um, thank you very much for having me on. Um, Let's talk uranium, mate. And it's it's quite pertinent on a on a day. Where, well, the day this has been recorded, uranium dropped to ninety five bucks a pound uh, at the end of last week. We thought it was going to get hammered today, but it's held. The equities have held up in the Aussie market. You would have some theories as to why. What are they? Um, maybe get into why it's fallen first, and then why it's holding up. So I think why it's fallen is sort of twofold i think that there's there was an expectation that this thing would just go up forever i.e from sort of august through to basically two weeks ago spot price moved up every day or pretty much every other day um in sort of incremental 50 cent to five dollar chunks and i think that from the equities point of view you know, investors have sort of thought that it would never end. And you've got to understand that there are certain participants in the spot market that don't work on the same sort of parameters that perhaps long-term thematic investors do, uh, perhaps like ourselves. So traders, for example, looking for a quick buck or looking to take some profit off the table, but also understanding that producers like Cameco, because Atomprom, um, especially the Cameco numbers, I think surprised the market. So that was the first sign. Of, that was the first bit of decline, wasn't it? Because that, um, yeah, exactly. They, yeah. Off the forward-looking numbers, it was it was sort of the announcement that everyone wanted, but it, equities uh, went down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were surprised by the Cameco numbers, but we weren't. It wasn't like it was. It wasn't like they were awful. It wasn't like they were totally out of sync with what everyone was thinking. I think that. Look, what, I think what surprised people is, is the spot purchase numbers for this year. So £2 million, pounds they said they were going to buy this year. There was a buy the next day. don't know if it was them or not. Um, but £2 million pounds total spot market purchase for this year is incredibly optimistic mm. in, our, in our view. Based off the fact that they purchased, I think, £13 million pounds last year. Um whether they would be able to get access to the same volume in the spot market this year, I don't think is even possible. But given ongoing supply issues, production issues at their key assets, I don't see a way in which they could only buy £2 million, especially if further problems come out of their Kazakh JV at, um, at Inkai. So, and especially considering well, they've flagged nameplate for both MacArthur River and Cigar Lake starting now... <laughs> Uh, it, at 18 million pounds each. That's, um, yeah, a lot exactly. has to go right by the sounds. Exactly. And I think that, you know, they, they, they've always done a good job, Cameco, on keeping investors calm, even in the midst of a storm. And <laughs> I think that um, we're in that storm at the moment. And they're just trying to at least deliver as much good news as possible, as is their job to do but i think that inevitably in the later half of the year we're going to have to see some flex on that sort of optimism out of management um and then that's sort of without even you know i know we'll get into kazakhstan and kazatom a bit later on but if we can just sorry quick quickly on spot you know we saw spot prices come back a bit off that news my, my view and, and the ocean wall view heading into this year was we were at sub 100 it was if everything goes to plan, i.e. if Cameco ramp up to what they say they can, if Kazat and Prom ramp up to what they say they can, which, which we always knew that they couldn't, I think the rest of the market did as well. All of these things go to plan. We're still at this $95 floor, <clears throat> about where we are now. Yeah. If we start to see further supply constraints, further production constraints like we have seen, 
we'll see prices move higher. Now we saw that, and you got to see the 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 the, the talk that uranium prices have to Kazakh production and to anything that comes out of Kazakhstan, as is. You know, it's the, you know, the first place that we started our work five years ago when we started to look at this again is Kazakhstan. And we were blown away by the lack of coverage, uh, it, not only in Kazakhstan, but of Kazatomprom as the world's largest producer. And so we thought this is a country that produces 43 percent of global supply. No one's looking at it. Um, so that could have maybe segues us into where we might go from here. And that is, you know, we've got. Because Atom Prom numbers, the full 23 numbers on March the 15th. And for those uranium investors who are sat there at the moment, slightly bleeding out, thinking, right, you know, why am I, why is Yellow Cake flat year to date? Well, the spot price is flat, number one. And number two, in terms of an upcoming catalyst, there is no better catalyst than, than Kazatom Prom to move the uranium price. Um, as we saw when they announced that initial production cut, they didn't even give a number and the price moved up $5 overnight. So I think that for now, you know, investors need to be focused on the fact that, again, there's people with shorter term time horizons on this, such as traders who can move the market. There's also an over, uh, there's been a bit of an overreaction, I think, from some of the utilities in terms of bidding down. But the long term thesis remains as strong as we've ever seen it. So Let's, um, you know, wait and see what happens in in the next few weeks. And then, and then and you'd have Cameco numbers coming out, quarterly numbers coming in April as well. So there could be a lot of ex- quick action. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that, for example, something that the markets missed is that on, on a recent, I didn't actually realize this, but I was, on a, I was on a call with a large investment bank recently who were hosting Kazatomprom, and they've said that they've pushed their 2025 production numbers. They're not going to release them to the market until August now. Yeah, well. So that's a pretty good indication of someone that doesn't want to tell you the truth, or doesn't <laughs> want to tell you the truth now. Um, you know, they were meant, to, I, I thought they were going to release those numbers in January, February, um, as they have done previously. They've, you know, they previously announced two years forward, um, or at least 18 months forward. We're going to get four months forward this year for 2025. Um, again, it's not surprising at all because I think that, you know, a lot of the work that I've done the last, especially the last few months, has been around the sulfuric acid problem, which we can definitely get into. Um, and, if we, you know, we think that March 15th will be quite revealing in terms of, in terms of how sort of the, the, the significance of that issue and the overall production sort of landscape for because that's a problem that's my birthday might be me bloody <laughs> might get a present there <laughs> special day maddie um but before we get into the the sulfuric acid issues that they're facing I'm, I'm keen to touch on the quotas that they have that the government sets in in kazakhstan and get a bit of insight into how you think about them so they've produced like 20 percent below these quotas which, which is a level they can you know they're permitted to produce within for a number of years and then they're looking to produce within 10% of that. At how have they sort of historically matched up with that? And what's the sort of tie in with the, the revolving door that they have at management at Kazadam from? Um, whether the production issues are linked directly to, to the sort of to the churn in management, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's obviously going to have an impact because you're not, if you're not meeting your targets, then, you know, management are obviously going to be the ones that that bear the brunt of that i think that a mistake that was made was guaranteeing or at least telling the market quite early on that they were going to go from 20 to 10 as if it was just a click of the fingers like we'll just go from 20 to 10 and it was an assumption from them that Issues that they were having at the time, although not as severe, around sulfuric acid shortages and a, 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 an element of resource depletion. But I don't really, you know, I, I don't think that that holds as much weight as as other arguments. That they could just, you know, click their fingers and go to ten percent below nameplate. This was also at a time when the Budenovskoy mine had, you know, a lot of news had come out around the Budenovskoy mine. And, you know, a lot of this is sort of speculation um, around this sort of, you know, the sale of Budenovskoy to, to some Russian oligarchs and whether that was, you know, a massive part or, or at least played its part in 
the first batch of management leaving has at and prompt. And I'd sort of like, you know, I personally like to sort of stay clear of that because I think that there's enough reason to look at Kazat and Prom and say, right, these are the issues without having to to sort of speculate. But I think that the way that we're looking at it now is the the big mistake was the 2025 production numbers were just massive. And it was so obvious to investors looking at their any of their financials really that the level of capex required to reach get even close to these 2025 production numbers was just not there it wasn't in their financial statements and it would have been blaringly obvious um and this sort of you know comes at a time when you know we hadn't looked into the sulfuric acid problem in as much detail until the sort of started at the end of last year beginning of this year but it's coming at a time when when Kazakhstan had previously announced a one and a half million ton per annum shortage of sulfuric acid, that's on a national scale. Um, despite the, you know, some of the numbers that we can get into around just j- just Kazakhstan, but we have, I mean, I've been to Kazakhstan. Um, my, my boss has been to Kazakhstan. Um, we've spent a good amount of time with Kazakh and Prom Management, with with the Arnu Energy team as well, the sort of Kazakh Uranium Fund, and there are some world-class management there for sure it's just there has been um there has been some inconsistencies let's say right quick break from benny feingold listeners because tell you what boys if this thesis is true these you companies they're going to have to get on the bloody investor hub and engage these uranium shareholders holy snap and duck shit this could get hectic you need to be on the front foot you need mate uranium shareholders there are lots of them and they're the companies need to be able to be speaking to them in the best, most efficient way possible. Mate, the questions are going to be just flying in, mate. As an MD or CEO, bloody put those uranium retail shareholders in your pocket. Oh, mate, I'll, I'll bloody put me left nut on it. They're going to love it. Simple as that. <laughs> mate, because of the engagement, the interactive comments on the announcements, bloody. And, mate, it's like they want to know something, you tell them you're all best friends, good for retail engagement. There's no other way to do it, I don't think, boys. Uh, well said, Matty. I reckon you're, you're spot on the money there. A lot of these uranium directors, managing directors, CEOs, whatever, they like to get active. They're on They're on Twitter. They're on LinkedIn and whatnot. Just sign up Investor Hub and speak with your shareholders. Uh, easy as that. You can even flood their mailboxes with uh, uranium email campaigns. Unparalleled investor in that analytics. It's just bloody un- – just, just be a good CEO and MD and be – an investor hub, CEO so or MD. On the, Simple we, as that. We talk about it with Benny, but, you know, we talk about other hedge funds buying and selling. What are they doing? You can actually see all of that data in a, in a far better, more, more coherent way than the, 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 the share directory is ever going to provide you if you just use investor hub. So and it's as simple brainer. as that. And when you bloody find the uranium tenement that you want to use to create this bloody share price and interaction with investors, you've got to have MMTS manage it for you. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's a two-step process. McMahon Mining Title Services, they fucking love uranium. They told me themselves. I, I tell you what I've seen lots of, mate, and that's lots of um, previously lithium companies now becoming uranium companies. Yeah. Did, did MMTS, do they do that for you? They help the lithuranium journey. <laughs> help a lithium company convert into a uranium company. And, mate, doesn't matter what bloody state you're in in Australia, you might be in an Aussie state that hates uranium at the moment, but... They mightn't hate it in the future. You never know. They managed bloody tenements in WA, South Australia, New South Wales, Queensland and Northern Territory. And as we know, there is an absolute metric fuck tonne of uranium in Australia. The biggest resource globally of uranium in this country. Mate. Well said, Matty. And by the, by the time those laws change, it's going to be too late. Get on the front foot now. Call up MMTS and get on top of it. Because, you, you, JD, you want to hang on to that uranium tenement like it's your firstborn child. And MMTS, they treat every tenement like their own children. It's as simple as that. It's the only na- name you need to remember for uranium tenement management in Australia. And, mate, sim- it's simple as that. We'll take it from there. They know right. more. Now that, now that uh, you've got all that in the back of your head, listeners, let's get back into the chat with Benny. Here we go. So why don't we un- unpack that that sulfuric acid issue a bit more? I think it's something that nobody had really cared about for you know a, a long time, and now all of a sudden all we're hearing about in in the uranium world from the bulls is there's this there's this massive shortage. Can can you give us a bit of 
background. I even now find it hard to actually find good information on what's actually going on. Where, where do they source it from? Why is the problem? Yep. There's insight into, you know, the intensity of sulfuric acid that they need rising from, you know, mid seventies, like ton to a uranium ton up to the, the hundred sort of level. So have you got a mm-hmm. bit more background on, on that, Ben? Sure. Sure. Yeah, we can go through it. So again, I mean, your listeners and you guys are aware how how much sulfuric acid is required for ISL mining. Um, it's used as a reagent, obviously, for, for, for uranium ore solution being injected into the mine. Um, increasing the production of uranium mining in Kazakhstan is heavily dependent on on increasing the, the the use of sulfuric acid. So a, a quick bit of history, sort of trip down memory lane, I guess, is that you know we, we took a deep dive into the Kazatomprom sulfuric acid plant today. So the first Kazatomprom sulfuric acid plant was built in 2011. They've since built one more. Both of these together have a capacity of about 680,000 tons per year. They currently require about one and a half million tons per annum. The current plants that were built, sorry, were built by the same contractor as the one who's just been awarded the the, the, the third sulfuric acid plant, which you know they're saying is going to come to market, start producing in 2026. It's an Italian company called Balestra. Um, we took a look at we took a look at what we think, sorry, at what how long it took for the first sulfuric acid facility from from giving the contract to producing at full scale it's called the stepnogorsk uh, sulfuric acid facility it took six years from the contract <clears throat> being awarded to full ramp up so if we take i think it was 22nd of january this year was when the third sulfuric acid contract was awarded to balestra so if we take that as day one and plus six now let's say that given the necessity for sulfuric acid today at Kazatomprom, that they can ramp up this, you know, that they, 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 they can maybe take a couple of years off the previous timeline for, for, for ramping up the production of sulfuric acid. So that's four years from now. So we think that the 2026 full ramp up number is incredibly optimistic. Now, we are not, and I really say this, we are not experts in the construction of sulfuric acid plants but we can take a pretty good guess when it's the same contractor as the previous sulfuric acid plant and we can apply a 30 percent discount in terms of a timeline because of the necessity that 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 is obviously apparent in the market today so even if they complete this by 2026 they'll need a ramp up that they'll need it to ramp up which takes about two years it's not that dissimilar to sort of a uranium mine so in our view, it's highly unlikely that, that they will be at full operation by 2026. In terms of Kazatomprom and their annual requirements, as I said, they currently require about 1.5 million tonnes per annum. They have a shortfall of, let's say, 750,000 tonnes. Um, and in their 2022 annual report, they highlighted that the Republic of Kazakhstan expects a deficit of about 1.5 million tonnes per annum by 2025. Why is this important? This is important because there are sort of two companies that compete for sulfuric acid on a sovereign national scale, Kazatomprom and a company called Kazphosphate. Kazphosphate are one of the largest uh, fertilizer producers in Central Asia. They're one of the largest suppliers of, of fertilizer to mainland Europe as well. So given the relative sort of necessity of the agricultural industry versus the uranium industry, there is a national mandate or a government mandate, which basically means that uh, CAS phosphate have got um, priority on delivery or have got priority if there is a shortage, which there is, on the sulfuric acid coming out of Kazakhstan. I think like, um, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting the dynamics there and the competition for it internally. I think to like, you know, a, an, an outsider, it's, it's hard to believe that there is just a shortage that can't be met by higher prices. Like, why can't you just import a bunch of sulfuric acid and that solves the production issue, especially if the economics make sense to produce more. What's the constraint around just importing sulfuric acid? So, so, so sulfuric acid, much like sort of, you know, we, we've, we're well covered in our uranium transport 
work. Sulfuric acid is categorized as a class eight material, um, given its toxic and corrosive attributes. Um, what this means is <clears throat> it results in a, a mass amount of bureaucracy in terms of safety protocols, logistical protocols, um, and the economically viable transportation methods for its import. So historically, they had operated at, you know, as we've said, 750,000 tons per annum shortfall, but they've been able to import this from Russia, China, and Uzbekistan. Supply out of Russia has become really difficult because some of the reagents that Russia need to produce sulfuric acid are now sanctioned. So the Russian supply problem for sulfuric acid is primarily due to sanctions. Uzbekistan, who are you know well um, documented as looking at ramping up their uranium production, are suffering a very similar sort of sulfuric acid shortfall to, to Kazakhstan. Um, and then China, as we're well aware, um, is sort of not only having their own sulfuric acid problems in terms of they're trying to um, rejuvenate or well, trying to expand their own agricultural industry, um, but they are also sort of in, they're not really in export mode for this kind of things, especially for things that are strategically important around uranium. But essentially, countries where Kazakhstan had relied on sulfuric acid prior to, let's say, 2022, they're just not as reliable sources of supply as they once were. Sanctions being, you know, playing a part, but also, uh, you know, as Uzbekistan looking to ramp up their own production as well. Um, in terms of transport, you know, as we mentioned, it's, you know, it's, it's categorized as class eight, but also you can't really fly it because it's so heavy. So, you know, a, a, an interesting statistic is that a freight plane can carry 50 to 100 tons. Um, so, you know, if you put that into numbers for sulfuric acid, it works out at about six and a half thousand dollars worth of sulfuric acid per flight. So it's just not economically viable to fly it either. Um, for example, Kazatomprom today pays $66 per ton. It's $99 million a year is the, is the current cost of Kazatomprom. It was 12% of their production costs in 2022. A number that we'll be looking at on March 15th is what this number is for 2023 or what this number was for 2023. We expect it to be to be a lot higher. So how? So you talked about the balance between the fertilizer industry and the uranium industry, but then if you go into the uranium or like Kazatomprom specifically, if they've got like this fixed amount that they're short on, how do they then balance where and how much of it's used for the Russian interest in it, and what uranium actually goes to China? Has anyone who's got the power there? Um. It's a good question, and it's it's one that that we sort of toss and turn on. I think that you know we view, in terms of priorities, we view Russia and China in quite a similar bracket, and then the the West in a completely opposite bracket. So, the the obligations we believe for Kazatomprom are going to be to China and Russia, and then pretty the Western equally. utilities, pretty equally. Yeah, yeah, pretty equally. I mean, in terms of in terms of contracts, China, are, uh, you know, dwarf that of, of of Russia in terms of the size of these contracts. Also, Russia have got huge influence on the ground in Kazakhstan in terms of the assets that they own. Um, China don't have nearly as many JVs in terms of pounds in the ground in Kazakhstan as Russia do. Our view is that if you look at it like this, look at it as... Kazakhstan have got contractual obligations in China, Russia, Europe, and and US. Europe and the US come come below in terms of not only volume, but if there was a decision to be made, i.e., the 2025 numbers, uh, sorry, the 2024 numbers had to be met to meet their contractual obligations. That was their words, right? As in, we have to ramp up in order to meet our contractual obligations. They've had to, you know, they've fallen short of that. They're going to fall short of that this year to the tune of about 15 to 20%. Um, someone's going to have to bear the brunt of that. Now, is it a yellow cake contract? Probably not because it's about a million pounds at today's prices. You know, it's not hugely significant. Um, the Arnu Energy, um, you know, the, the, the Arnu Energy Kazakh Uranium Fund, we still haven't heard news out of them in terms of whether they were going to supply 
the fund with uranium. Um, and then, you know, in terms of is it Western utilities? Maybe it's another thing that we're looking at for March 15th is the regional sales versus 2022. So I think the regional sales number for China was about 50% in 2022. We expect this to be a, a, a lot higher in 2023 and four. Um, and again, sort of without wanting to repeat myself, someone's going to bear the brunt of that. Um, and we would assume it's Western utilities, not Chinese or, or, or Russians. And what are their inventory levels looking like, Ben? How does that play into it? That's the number one thing that we're looking at. That's the number one thing that we're looking at for March 15th. We thought that we would see it in the numbers in February. Um, we have done a full breakdown of every producing asset in Kazakhstan, cross-referenced it with their contractual obligations. And we think that in order for them to meet production, in order for them to meet their contractual obligations in 2023, they would need to draw down inventories to their lowest point in a decade. Um, those numbers were done before the production cut. So historically, because Atomprom have kept, let's say, about 12 million pounds of inventory, we think that they will be well below that um, in their latest report. Um, they're looking, and you know, we sort of kept our ear to the ground in terms of speaking to various people in the market. They're look, they have been looking at in the past six months very very short term delivery contracts, i.e., you know, one to two month deliveries. Um, this is, you know, in our view, implies a sense of urgency, but also, you know, what is also well documented is that because Atom probably about buying in the market, you know, they they were about buying the spot market this year. It's the world's largest uranium producer, about buying the spot market, and this is also <laughs> this is also a company that, to their credit throughout the bear market and also sort of from you know 2019 as we sort of pivoted towards higher pricing have said we will not produce unless we have contracts that we can sell into so exercising supply discipline given what happened you know in the 10 years preceding uh 2019 so if they have you know they convey this voice of calm as is their job to do um but if you're back in the spot market buying and you've sort of said, right, you know, we can produce as much as we want when we want, not they didn't they haven't said that, but we can go from 20 to 10 to nameplate sort of in quite quick succession. And then you're back buying the spot market. I just think that's indicative of, of an element of urgency, at least. I, I don't like the word panic necessarily, but it's um, there's definitely, you know, something hasn't gone to plan if they're back buying the spot market. Why would they want to buy in the spot market when they can pull pounds out the ground for $20 in Kazakhstan? And we're just quickly tying it back into to Kamika and like, excuse my ignorance on like, because I'm not too up on who's putting into the spot and who's putting into contracts, but very simplistically, you got, because that a problem, what, pumping out what they were doing, 60 million pounds or so. You got Cigar Lake mm. and MacArthur River that are collectively going to do between them, hopefully. 36 million pounds and then you got the spot which is not selling the mandate not to sell anything and but there's these potential shortfalls everywhere where the fuck does it come from like is mm. it just adding it up everywhere else on a much smaller scale but they're such big players and then if they're falling short how do they then fulfill it and i think that's why Exactly that point is that's why these corrections in prices today is an amazing buying opportunity for investors because exactly what you say, the long-term thesis remains the exact same. We are in a structural supply deficit of 50-odd million pounds this year, if not 60 this year. In order for that to be met, <clears throat> we need five Kazakh mines, five Kazakh-scale mines to come online. So when people talk about a US producer coming back online and ramping up one, you know, doing a million pounds this year. A million pounds is less than 2% of the deficit. So the market this year was expecting Budenovskoy <coughs> to come back on, sorry, to come online, world's largest uranium mine. And they've been, you know, and, and Kazatomprom have been very transparent about the fact that there's going to be issues in meeting their previously attained targets for this year. <clears throat> How can 
prices over the short to medium term stay below this threshold when the market was expecting these to come back online and we were at $100 a pound already. So I think this gives, I think it lends um, credibility to this point around this is a very short term correction in prices and there is no visibility or there is no obvious um, solution to this deficit in the short to medium term. One of the most unique things, if not the most unique thing about the uranium commodity story versus other commodity stories is this lack of a supply side response. It takes 10 to 12 years on average from exploration to production for uranium for a Western uranium mine. So one, a company that we've done a lot of work with, Fission Uranium Core, they discovered uh, PLN um, in 2012. They didn't start producing until 20, they, they won't start producing until 2029. Um, you know, it's a 17 year lead time between exploration and production. So th there's a few reasons for this. It's the inherent bureaucracy of uranium. It's also the fact that there was a 10 year uranium winter where no one was producing or no one was ramping up production. So what was happening during this 10 year period? Lithium, copper, nickel, all of these energy transition metals were taking the talent away from the uranium industry because uranium experts, miners, uh, engineers, people who had worked on these large assets for so long, they weren't just standing outside in the cold, twiddling their thumbs, sort of saying, you know, waiting for someone to say, right, let's go back into production. They were going to get paid more money to go and work on a new, exciting copper mine somewhere else, probably somewhere slightly more luxurious than the Athabasca Basin. Um, and, and so there's been an exodus of talent from the industry, I think, especially on the mining side. And it's a key bottleneck that we're looking at in terms of ramping up production is there's just not that there's not the expertise to start ramping up production in the West in Western at Western uranium mines. Again, this sort of like click of a finger that might happen in other commodity stories. It's just not there in uranium. And it's what makes this. It's what's going to it's what's going to exaggerate this supply deficit, we think, over the next five years. Ben, I'm keen to um to, to ask a little bit about some of the participants in the in the spot market. When, when I listened to the the Cameco, uh, the latest Cameco call, you know, it was it was interesting to appreciate how how the incentive for Cameco in a lot of ways is is actually you know not not to sell very much into the spot market themselves because then obviously price goes higher and it allows them to to capture forward contracts with a much higher floor price, which is where they'll kind of benefit in the long run. Um, and uh, yeah, I imagine that that same dynamic is the case for for Kazata Prom in some ways. Um, there is there is in some ways a bit of an incentive to 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 you know constrain the amount that you uh, you know selling to the spot market, which is hence why the dynamics of the spot market are are such that not many of these big producers are actually you know transacting it all too much. But one 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 market participant that that has been transacting in the spot market a fair bit is is that of hedge funds. What what kind of work have you done on understanding the hedge fund participants in the spot market and what type of market participants are they? Hedge funds were the were the apex predator in the previous bull market, and you know we saw prices move higher, but it was hedge funds that really squeezed the price um, in two thousand and seven. The prices were up four and a bit times, but they really, you know, they were the cause of the spike. Today, the role that hedge funds are playing um, is a lot more prominent than in previous years. So we estimate, and again, having spoken to sort of industry participants who have been doing this a lot longer than I have, that 40 to 50 hedge funds have got physical uranium uh, contracts, sorry, physical uranium licenses. Um, these hedge funds will have volumes of a couple of hundred thousand pounds up to, you know, single digit million pounds. Um, we think that the, you know, the, the, the hedge fund that's got the most uranium is probably a little bit shy of 10 million pounds. So they are not to be discounted at all. But let's say that the total hedge fund inventory as such is 20 to 30 million pounds. And to your point, hedge funds operate quarter to quarter. They don't operate on a, you know, 
long term thematic, you know, buy and hold. They've seen prices rise up, you know, five times from the lows. They're going to take some. They're going to take some off the table because they have, you know, investors to answer to on a quarterly basis. What we think that that's going to to cause is maybe not the exact same as last time, but we think that hedge funds are ha, have barely started to play their role in terms of in terms of um, the impact on pricing yet. So you know, last week it was it was documented that Goldman Sachs were ramping up their physical uranium um, sort of offerings to clients. Um, Goldman Sachs have pretty consistently been the largest daily buyer of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust as well. So financials as a whole, you know, if we put them, you know, together, that's one thing that we are fortunate enough to have quite good visibility on at, at Ocean Wall is we can see that there is appetite for this, that there is appetite for this, uh, for this trade. And I think that that is if we go maybe on a slight tangent here, I think that's been proven by what happened last year with Cameco, i.e. there was appetite to get into the uranium space and the large cap, Cameco, was up 100% and the juniors were up 50 completely inverted to any other market. So what that tells us is that hedge funds or, or, or investment banks looking for size, um, they realize, right, I love the uranium trade, I want to play it, but the only thing that I can buy is Cameco. It's the only thing I can get past my risk manager, it's the only thing that I can get any relative size in. So, for you know, on in the basis on the basis of uranium as a whole, there's appetite for it from hedge funds. In terms of physical, we think that this story is sort of just beginning, and, and we think that hedge funds are, are, will, will play a massive role um, in, in the next five years. Is the is the trade for those hedge funds simply to to go long the physical and squeeze the market, or are they are they doing something else a bit nifty in terms of how they're trying to create? alpha in the trade like what do you what do you what do you kind of think about that i think that if you're a hedge fund and let's say you're a multi-billion dollar hedge fund and for you to get a position in this you've got to have a 50 million dollar position if you want to do that it's probably a bit easier to do that in physical than it is in the equity space because in the equity space to size yourself into a uranium to size yourself into an equity position you know you could do it in sprot you could do it over a bit of time in yellow cake um but also you know I think that hedge funds look at it and they say yellow cake's trading at a 16% discount as of this morning. Sprott's trading at a 15% discount as of this morning. We, you know, these things have been at discounts 90% of the, the time they've been trading. Um, why, you know, the argument that maybe we used to have was these things are trading at a 15% discount. It's really, really cheap access to pounds. And that is true in the scenario of which yellow cake gets bought or spot gets bought or they have to release their pounds because you get your 20% you get your 20% uh, profit on the day that these things get sold i think the hedge funds looking at it now just say i can buy and own this thing if i have a long term view that this thing's going to go up then i'd rather just own it than have my equity sat at a 20% discount or a 15% discount um, that's what surprised us i think is is the extent of these discounts, given the fact that we believe, and you know, I'm sure you guys and a lot of your listeners believe that uranium should trade at a premium um, if you are bullish on the long-term price. Ben, you've done a, a bunch of fascinating work as well on how uranium gets out of Kazakhstan. So, sort of circling back to Kazatomprom, and you've you've pointed out the the previous route was most commonly through Saint Petersburg, but now there's this Cas Caspian route, which is really begun to dominate given the sanctions and, and everything we've seen. But this has obviously had a significant impact on the, the cost and both logistically, I think sort of going back to your point on sulfuric acid, it's just a, a whole lot harder. I think just to start with, can you can you paint that picture for the listeners? Because I don't think it's as widely held and I don't think there's that many people familiar with it. Sure. It was summer 22, and my boss came back into our office and put a map of Kazakhstan on my desk um, and said, basically, this is your summer. We need, you know, we had a view that there were transport issues coming out of Kazakhstan, and I basically spent the summer of 2022 
in my flat with a map of Kazakhstan, mapping out um, potential bottlenecks on that transport route. And the sort of history of this is that 2018 Russia World Cup, Football World Cup, um, and some of the Class 7 cargo, i.e. uranium, wasn't allowed to bypass, wasn't allowed to go past St. Petersburg. So, because Atomprom had to implement a, a, a nascent alternative transport route via the Transcaspian, just to give some idea of the complexity of this versus St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg, you can go from your mines in, sorry, in, in Kazakhstan, in southern Turkestan, and you can run this material up by rail to St. Petersburg in less than two weeks. The Transcaspian route, you have to run it by rail to the port of Aktau on the western uh, coast of Kazakhstan. You've got to run it via the Transcaspian Sea down to the port of Baku in Azerbaijan. You've then got to run it by rail from the port of Azerbaijan up to the port of Poti in Georgia. You've then got to run it down along the Bosphorus um, through the Black Sea. And then you've got to, and then it can start its journey to the west. The level of bureaucracy that comes with going via four countries as opposed to just going via Russia inherently brings a, a completely new level of complexity to a transport route. So what happened in 2022 and three is that Cameco's JV at Inkai saw some of its material get held up at Azerbaijan, in, in Azerbaijan. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that Although it doesn't go directly through a conflict zone, the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia does play its role in terms of th th this uh, transport route goes very, very close to that border. So it's just another thing to sort of be aware of. Um, we estimate that, well, if let's say that the uranium, sorry, the, the, the St. Petersburg route um, costs a few dollars a pound. Um, in terms of transport, we think that this number is significantly higher by the Transcaspian route. That is to do with insurance premiums. It's to do with, again, you're having to pay multiple different uh, sort of red tape um, export licenses, these kind of things by these different countries as well. So Cameco's uh, Inkai pounds got stuck in Azerbaijan for about six months. So what this means in the sort of overall grand scheme of the uranium thesis is you've got a country that produces 43 percent of global supply it's four times that of the saudi's dominance in oil and historically they ran all of their western exports via st petersburg and they're now they now claim that they are running 70 percent of western exports via the transcaspian you can take this into one of two ways the Transcaspian route, route is working absolutely fine and there's no problems at all, or they're just sending less pounds to the West. And so in terms of, you know, 70% of, 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 of their overall volumes, it, it's probably just going to be less pounds that they're, that they're running via that route. Also, as far as we're aware, they had a, they had a physical quota in, from Azerbaijan that they were only allowed to run about three to 6,000 tonnes per year via the Transcaspian route. And if they're running 70% of this material via this route, then, you know, that's it's significantly higher than that quota. What we believe is, and, you know, because Atomprom have come out and said they could run material via Shanghai, via China. Uranium's never left China, and it's definitely not going to leave China to go to the US or to Canada. It's just not in their interest, and, and geopolitically, it makes no sense for them. But also, given the Chinese nuclear growth strategy, they're not going to let uranium leave the country. So... The Chinese route, you know, again, we've written a we've written a report called Chasing the Dragon, Why Uranium Can't Go Via China. Great, and, great title, by the way. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I, I, I will give my boss credit for that one. <laughs> um, um, but the Chinese route comes with its own set of complications. I would urge anyone that's listening to this to check out our, our website and you can read these reports, oceanwall.com. Um, Transcaspian route, again, level, levels of bureaucracy above anything that comes with St. Petersburg. And also an associate much higher associated cost. So we think this is a key bottleneck that investors don't necessarily, you know, look at in enough detail. And what about expanding onto the enrichment side? With the there's still pending to go through the Senate. Is it the U.S. ban of importing enriched uranium from Russia? So. Mm -hmm. 
from what I've seen, like the main players, you've got um, R- Rosatom, CNNC, so that's Russia, China, mm-hmm. but then you've got uh, Arano and Yuranko. What mm-hmm. is this setting up the fact that like Yuranko and Arano are going to be very powerful in providing enriched uranium to the West if you scrap the other two? How's that looking going forward? Um, enrichment for LEU to three and a half to, to, to three to five percent will probably, you know, over the next five years be sold by exactly those names, Urenko, Arano. Now we need to scale up production in the West, but um, this is something that can be sold. It's not going to be easy, and we're sort of yet to see. I think this massive investment into these into these assets that they require. But you know, we've seen you know we've seen decent size ramp ups from the likes of Arano and uh, and Urenko. What's really interesting, and maybe this is sort of a segue into next generation nuclear, is the bottleneck in Halo. Is the bottleneck in enriching uranium up to 19.75%. Um, if you are a believer like we are in next generation SMRs and you see 28 countries have pledged at COP28 to triple nuclear capacity by 2050, it is nigh on impossible to do this via traditional nuclear, especially in the West. So so, so the at- SMRs, what... what um- U235 percentage do they operate at? Between 10, well, some SMRs, few SMRs require LEU. Most SMRs, about 85 to 90% of approved designs require HALU, which is between 10 to 19.75%. And, cause, and how long does that add on to the enrichment time? Um, at the moment, it's pretty much impossible to get this material at commercial volume. So the only commercial supply of Halo is currently in Russia. Yeah. We've we've done a lot of work on this space, particularly particularly looking at a company called AFP Isotopes. Um obviously, you know, by extension looking at Centrus and Silex as well. The the, the current numbers around this are that from 2024 we're going to require, just for the development stage of these reactors, about five tonnes per annum of HALU. Centrus Energy is the only current commercial Western supplier of HALU. And when I say commercial, they'll produce about 900 kilograms. So about 20, you know, less than 20% of what's currently required. And most of that's going to go straight to the DOE for their advanced um, reactor development program. So... If you're a Western SMR, you know, company like TerraPower, Bill Gates' TerraPower, for example, they've delayed the startup of their reactor by two years because they can't access the fuel that they need. So just very quickly on SMRs, the reason they're a necessity is because you can't reach these nuclear ambitions in, by, by using traditional nuclear, or at least it's going to be very, very difficult. In places like the UK, for example, Sizewell C is going to cost us $34 billion dollars going to be years and years over schedule and this is sort of given the you know again the bureaucracy around nuclear but also you know we need to have this sort of production line economics which you know Ford Model T sort of you can't do this with large-scale nuclear reactors SMRs can be built prefabricated in factories they have you know they can have a hundred day build time on site and um, you can really start to scale the production of nuclear using these using these units. The number one bottleneck in rolling these things out at scale is the lack of fuel. Is the lack of is the lack of halo. So, if you look at the uranium supply deficit for U three hundred eight today, the, the the supply deficit for halo will dwarf that. In it, it probably it probably already does, but especially looking out over sort of a five year, ten year time horizon. So we've done a lot of work on this space. I was in South Africa last uh, uh, ten days ago, looking at the ASP isotopes facilities, um, uh, uh, their enrichment facilities, and you know we believe this is a really really interesting place for investors to look over the next couple of years, um, because. If you are a believer in SMRs like we are, 
uh, and the, the necessity that, well, how much we need them if we're going to get even close to our nuclear ambitions globally, then the number one issue is is fuel. And so how long would it take to, from concept to production, to bring on a HALU enrichment facility? So Centrus have sort of said that I think it's 42 months, so three and a bit years from when they get their license to ramp up to six metric tons. And it's multi-billion dollars worth of capex. Yep. Centrus use centrifuges, which are sort of 40 foot tall, massive cylinders that spin really, really, really quickly. And they go, you know, that you're able to separate U-235 from U-234 and 38. Um, and then you pass the U-235 through to the next centrifuge and it does it again and again and again and again and again until you get your desired level of, uh, of enrichment. It's a very, very capital intensive and, uh, and time consuming process, not to mention the fact that let's say this is 120 centrifuges to get to six metric tons. It's the size of a football field. You know, it's, it, these are massive, massive projects. And this is the technology that Russia uses to, to, to enrich to, to, to LEU. So really, really, really useful technology for enriching to three to five percent but incredibly difficult for enriching to 19.75%, just given the extra level of, of energy usage, but also land footprint, capex, et cetera. Um, ASP isotopes, on the other hand, they think that they are able to start building a plant, f from starting to build a plant to ramping up production in about two years, in about two years. And they can do this for less than $100 million per unit. So let's say that it's, at least at a minimum a tenth of the cost of using centrifuges but also being able to ramp up production and it's on a much 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 smaller scale so i was looking at some of their plants in, in south africa and while they're not halu plants um they are you know they're, they're not big they're using a completely different type of technology called laser excitation um uh, called quantum enrichment um not that dissimilar to, to Silex in terms of laser excitation, but a completely different level of selectivity, which allows it, it, an enrichment factor, which is much, much higher than Silex potentially. So are, that, are they doing the, the conversion in those facilities as well, the fluoride conversion, or they, that's done separately before it gets to them? Yeah, so, so it's a great question because the sort of golden goose of, the, uh, uh, of ASP isotopes, but also Silex, as is well documented, is the fact that they can re-enrich depleted tail. So there's hundreds of thousands of metric tons of depleted uranium sat in the US, uh, uh, all over the world. And this actually allows you to sort of skip a step in, in terms of enrichment to HALU. But they're not looking at doing the conversion themselves. They're looking at taking... Um, natural uranium or leu that's already been converted um and enriching this up to uh, up to halo levels yeah right up. yep ben i want to take a, a different tack you, you mentioned um china before and you've put some numbers toward the the potential impact a lot of people have spoken about you know what what they can do but you've actually put some numbers toward how many pounds they could suck out of the over, out of the market over, I think you said till 2035, talking about in the vicinity of a, a billion pounds. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I've got heaps of questions in and around this, but f first of all, what's your sort of conviction in this, in this thinking? Uh, let, let's say that China has sat on three to 400 million pounds today. The, the billion pound procurement strategy for China sort of gives uh it gives you some idea of the scale of their nuclear ramp up as opposed to just looking at it and saying oh my word that's a lot of uranium yes it is but it also gives you some idea of how uh, of how ambitious their nuclear uh, growth strategy is china have always been very good at procuring for the future and they've always been very good at positioning themselves to ensure that they don't feel the brunt of um maybe external market forces or, or, or panic in the market in certain commodities. We've seen it in rare earths. We've seen it in lithium. They're just ahead of the curve on these things. They tend to be very ahead of the curve on these things. And it's also testament to the fact that they sort of do what they say they're going to do. 
and they said that they're going to ramp up. They're going to they're going to build 150 new reactors in China. Um, they're just going to go and build a nuclear power plant where they say they are. They don't have to go through this sort of you know level of sort of bureaucracy, and you know they can just go out and do it. So they're doing the exact same thing with with, with uranium procurement. The, the strongest market signal of this is the Alashanku uranium bonded warehouse on the Kazakh Chinese border. It's just a warehouse designed to store a lot of uranium. And, you know, these contracts between Kazakhstan and China are, are just on a scale that we haven't really seen before in the uranium market. They are just taking whatever they can and they are strategic and, and they're positioned. I mean, in terms of geography, they're just positioned in the best possible place. They share a border with the world's largest producer. They've built a warehouse. They've said, give us whatever you can give us pretty much. And they're going to make sure that their nuclear growth strategy is not hindered by a lack of fuel. Now, a million things can go wrong in building a nuclear facility. They're getting pretty good at it. Um, I think there's sort of just shy of 20 under construction in China at the moment, which is you know unheard of, especially coming from the UK, where it's like we can't get anything done in less than 20 years in terms of nuclear. Um, this strategy as well, right, of producing one-third themselves, um, sourcing one-third off the uh, the spot market and the the other third contracted, I believe. It, is that something you, you think is pretty plausible? Yeah, so I think it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a third domestically, a third from their own JVs, um, yeah, and then a third, and, right. and then a, and then a third imported. Um, I think that, especially with their presence in in Africa as well, that they're going to be fine in terms of procuring that. In terms of procuring uranium, a question that I get asked quite a lot is in terms of risks to the trade. Is this is obviously the largest quantum of volume sat anywhere in the world, so. You know, I get asked, what happens if China flood the market with uranium? Why on earth would they do that? I mean, they, they have been so, so clear about their ambitions for rolling out nuclear in the country. It's just in, not in their interest whatsoever. Now, the more interesting question there is, what is the flex in their Kazakh contracts? So, again, you know, what we've spoken about over the last sort of hour has been Kazakhstan, and the important role that they play in the global uranium nuclear fuel cycle. Um, will China allow Kazakh, uh, allow Kazakhstan or Kazakhstan to flex down on those contracts? Again, we've just got to take it as take it as we see it, and and realize that it's just not there. It's not the way that they do things. It's not the way they do things. They are greedy. Is is a harsh way of saying it. I think that they're just convicted um they know what they need to do and as i say they're not going to let a lack of fuel hinder their nuclear rollout strategy and and they're really you know in line with building out all these these facilities building the the expertise that we've sort of forgotten in part in in the west and there's this notion that they're gonna you know build this nuclear expertise in terms of actually building the reactors and and so on and get to the level where they can you know lend it out in a sense, build it in Western countries and whatever the sort of arrangements end up being, whether Western countries, you know, pay pay for the energy and, and so on. Is this a, a a theory that you've given much weight to? Sorry, w w whether China will, will end up export? building, yeah, end up building reactors in places like, you know, the US, Australia, these sorts of things, because we might just not know how we'll get to the point in, in the West. Just like lithium. Yeah, I mean, China are not going to build nuclear reactors in in the US. Um, again, a, a report that I wrote last summer was Russia's sort of stranglehold on <clears throat> global nuclear markets. And I don't think that anyone can deny Russia's presence in terms of reactor construction and also, you know, how this is going to increase over the next few decades. Obviously, again, not, not in the US. But China, I mean, they've just got enough going on at home. <laughs> they, 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 
maybe I guess the question is once they develop, you know, once they rolled out their nuclear strategy, I mean, it's going to take them 10 years, 15 years <clears> to do so anyways. Um, are they going to apply that same sort of production line economics to other countries? I don't really think so. I, I don't think so. I mean, they don't have a huge presence in terms of on a, on a global scale in terms of reactor construction. What's been really interesting for us is looking at sort of Westinghouse versus Rosatom and the role that Westinghouse will play or the increasing role that Westinghouse will play in replacing Rosatom in the global nuclear um, sort of landscape, whether it's fuel or reactor construction or care and maintenance work. But again, I would urge anyone listening to this to read uh, the, the report that we wrote on Russia last summer it really gives you some idea as to the scale of this grip that Russia have in the global nuclear market, not just in fuel. You know, these, you know, Rosatom are, because of how long these projects take, once you, let's say you're Rosatom and you build a nuclear power plant in Bangladesh or in Turkey, you're there for, you're there for 60 to 80 years. Rosatom make sure that they're the only ones that, know these reactors inside and out they're the only ones that can provide care and maintenance they're the only ones that can provide fuel services they make themselves strategically imperative to the countries in which they build so turkey for example they are financing the entire construction of their four units there they said let us build it and then you know that's russia's foot that, that, that's russia's foothold in turkey now for the next 60 80 100 years it's, it's it, you know the, the the beauty of nuclear power is that it's for the long term and it's these are not short term projects you're not building a wind farm and then you know going elsewhere and or or a solar farm and going elsewhere and doing the next project it's like these things require ongoing care and maintenance for decades at a time thanks for telling yeah, me I how to pronounce rosata correctly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I completely agree. And that, that angle with Rosatom and, and Turkey is kind of what I've got in mind. The US would be an extreme example for the Chinese to go into, but, you know, they're, they've they got this Belt and Road Initiative and they've not been afraid in the past to, to go and build infrastructure and various things across Africa and across across the, the world. So, yeah, and just to round out the um, the, the conversation Ben, I was curious to hear on on contracts. We've spoken about spot long term contracts, and there's this influence that price ceilings and price floors have played over the last you know twelve or thirteen years since the the um, incident in Japan. Are there lessons that these utilities have have learnt from how they you know were those pricing deals were structured that you think are starting to change? and how these contracts are being priced going forward? I think that the lesson that they've learned is the importance of thinking long-term. And I say that they've learned that in terms of that the, the, they're paying the price for that now. The fact that they weren't thinking long-term during the bear market, i.e. they weren't sucking up as much uranium as possible. Because we're now in a position where we are five years into prices turning um, off a floor of $17. And utilities still seem to be very short pounds, uh, particularly the US, particularly US utilities. Now, you know, Europeans are, are not in a dissimilar position. But I think that again, I think something that investors need to focus on is that is this difference between spot and term pricing. I mean, we saw an RFP come out for it's a 14-year contract. Utilities are starting to look into the future now for the first time. Uh, sorry, not for the first time. They're starting to look further into the future than, than they have previously. And I think this is sort of why the term market is this crystal ball and is very indicative of utility uncertainty. Last year was, you know, sort of replacement rate contracting for the first time in a decade. Um, we expect this to be much higher this year um, and sort of waiting for the latest sort of UXC consultancy numbers as to how we've started this year off. But utilities are sort of, 
I think especially in the US are bearing the brunt of a uh, of a pretty shambolic policy by particularly the US around having your own domestic fuel supply and this sort of started in the US in 1993 the megatons to megawatts program which basically meant that the US said you know we're going to rely on Russia for pretty much all of our uranium enrichment going forward and it's just got them into a place where right now you know they are they're paying the price for not investing in their own domestic fuel cycle for the past 30 years and utilities i think have learned not to rely on domestic policy in as in as stringent a way as perhaps that they had previously i.e we need to start to think for ourselves we need to start to think that regardless of what you know whether we're being conveyed a sense of harm and you know the good times will never end if something like what happened you know when russia invaded ukraine can i mean it's literally flipped the entire uranium market on its head on the day and if you're a us utility at that point you're thinking how on earth am i going to solve for this so we see all these titles coming out of the us or you know various news articles saying us to ban russian uranium and you read the fine print of these articles or you sort of actually start to dig into you know these different sanctions <clears throat> that they're sort of reducing reliance over the next decade but you can't go into the house you can't go into the senate as a u.s utility and vote for a ban on russian uranium turkey's voting for christmas it makes absolutely no sense at all because you have no stable source of supply outside of russia you have no stable supply domestically so they're learning this lesson the hard way and i think that going forward at least that's what might have changed in in the mentality of utilities what what's going to eventually force the spot to sell uranium is it going to happen i think the only thing that could ever force spot or yellow cake to sell the uranium is a force majeure government coming in and saying right this is now impacting the average consumer it's impacting the average household too much uranium prices are bonkers the cost of nuclear is now significantly higher give us uranium is that the uk um, government would have to do whether that? it's the uk or uk us i mean you know we're, we're, we've sort of been believers that yellow cake would get bought by an edf or by a, a european utility at some point um for us, that's the time to get out the trade. Yeah, can is you... the is the force majeure government stepping in? But by that point, prices are going to be so much higher that it's going to be a good time for you to sort of take a step back and look at it and say, right, however long you've been in it for, this is a good time for you to 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 cash in your chips. But can you can you expand on you know? On, on how you see things playing out a bit more like what is what does end game look like you're you're obviously kind of you know betting your cards on on uranium price melt up given the the supply work you've done how does how does what does end game actually really look like from your perspective how you've mapped it out the most probable scenario we have 2025 as being the year where the supply crunch hits its peak um because we're gonna have real visibility into Kazakh and, and, and Canadian numbers. And we're also gonna have real visibility. It would have been 12 to 18 months since we have at a higher incentive price for Western production. So we're gonna have real visibility into how much Western production can actually come online in the long term, uh, come online in the long term. So 2025 uh, and the rest of this year, we expect higher pricing. Uh, you know, I, I think that I wouldn't be surprised to see us finish this year well north of sort of 130 140 million dollars 130 140 dollars a pound um i think longer term the exit strategy is sort of as i say this sort of force majeure situation but also you know everyone has their everyone has their price at which they're willing to cash in their chips for us we don't necessarily want to put a price on it but we're fortunate enough at Ocean Wall that we've sort of, you know, we've got our ear to the ground on, you know, we've got our sort of fingers on the pulse of this market. And 
I think there's going to be a point at which so a, a government intervention or a a supply side response, but a very, very slow one. So when we start to see the early embers of a supply side response, i.e. a, you know, arrow is going to come online or a new Kazakh deposit is going to come online and they're going to be able to ramp it up or a solution to the sulfuric acid problem. Once we start to see these early embers of a genuinely meaningful supply side response, which we don't think is anywhere near, we, which we don't think we are anywhere near, um, then we'll start to consider, um, you know, getting out of this trade. But I think that we've got a way to go until there. But also a sort of final thing on that is that we should be in a sustained higher pricing environment for, for a long time here, given the fact, you know, the reason that we are in this trade is a belief, a fundamental belief in nuclear power and the growth of nuclear power. That's not going anywhere anytime soon. And uranium prices should be higher for longer. The question is how high for how long? And that's going to completely depend on Kazakhstan's ability to ramp up and whether the whether resource depletion starts to play more of a factor. Or well, you got five years or so up your sleeve for Arrow, I'd say. So. Abs uh, uh, absolutely. And that's why... You know, I'm always happy to talk about an exit strategy, but it's not something that investors should be considering today. Well, I think that, and, and I and I and I think that's you may you know, I think investors who maybe have got out over the last few weeks. I mean, obviously some investors have because equities have uh, have have been quite poor, but I think that that some investors looking at it and saying, "Bull market's over," you know. We hit 105, prices have come off $10. You know, we've had our fun. Some of the investors that have been in it since 2018, um, short-term thinkers, people that, you know, maybe don't understand the, the, the intricacies of the market to the same level. Um, and again, this all stems from the, the lack of a supply-side response. Ben, just um, just thinking about the financial plays as well, given you, you think about their, their inventory and, and because the the spot market obviously um, is is relatively thinly traded compared to compared to you know what what production is or what what supply is actually needed, um, are any of these financial plays, for example, you know, play, are they going to potentially play some games along the way? Do you think they'll they'll see that their equities are actually just high beta on the on the physical, and then they'll they'll you know dump physical into the spot market because they're, they're short the equities and they'll make money like that along the way. Are you kind of, you know, are you prepared? For, like, is that, is that happening? Will that happen? Is that sort of part of your base case? Is the volatility along the way from games like that? Definitely. A hundred percent. And I think that's testament to what's going on right now is, I mean, you guys know this better than anyone. If you're in this uranium trade, you have to be able to stomach highs and lows along the way. And again, this sort of goes back to maybe the first thing that we spoke about is financials operating on a completely different time horizon to everyone else. So they're going to try and do everything that they can, whether it's a hedge fund or an investment bank or whatever it is, to squeeze every penny out of this trade that they possibly can. And it's going to be done through complex instruments, exactly what you talk about. But that does not detract anything from the long-term thesis. So... If you're fully invested in uranium today, close your eyes and sort of wake up in a couple of years' time. But if you're looking at trading it, you're going to have plenty of brilliant opportunities to get in, uh, 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 you know, to, to properly average down on some of these equities, um, particularly those that are linked to physical. Oh, beautiful, mate. That was uh, sensational. My, um, Fascinating. I'll have to listen back to that one. Yeah, no, about six or seven times. <laughs> no, really, really appreciate it, mate. It'd be good to, um, mate, we'll grab you, grab you again in the future. It'd be really good to do a bit of a deep dive on the Athabasca Basin, like especially Absolutely. with Cigar Lake and MacArthur River, even just around the techniques of extracting it and what the biggest, um, biggest constraints are on them meeting those production targets. So, but uh, hey, we'll keep happy. that up our sleeve, Cobber. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm always happy to do it. It's always um 
I feel like the sector is so badly covered. So the work that you guys do is is much appreciated. And I mean, there's just what's what's great for us is that people think that the investment banks, big investment banks, are the. Can you you got me or not? Yep. Yeah, mate. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, no, um, the cleaner was about to walk in. I just had to like, tell him to hold up. Sorry, cover. I think, that, I think that, you know, people look at the investment banks as this, like, barometer of, like, I mean, they've got everything wrong. They've got absolutely they, – they, they've consistently got everything wrong, whether it's uranium price targets or whether it's equity price targets. You've just got to go really, really deep into this space in order to get any kind of information edge. Um, we can so, tell you've done I, I'm, that. I'm, yeah, for my sins, basically all, all I've done for the last four years. You've, you've gone as deep as uh, the deposits in the Athabasca Basin, yeah, mate. True. <laughs> <laughs> nah, very good, Ben. Thanks right. hey, for your time, mate. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. No um, problem. Oh, it's no good. Problem it's at all. good for you, anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Appreciate Absolutely. It, ben. Thank Be you. back soon. All right, guys. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Bye. Yeah. Right, oh, beautiful, mate. Uranium, uranium, uranium. What, buddy? Didn't talk about anything else. That Simple is, as that. That is the best insight you're going to get for free on the internet about uranium. And it, and it will stay th- free. So if you've just listened to us for the first time, click that fucking subscribe button and we will love you forever. That's all it is. You have That's my all life. it is. You have my love. <laughs> Give the bloody like. Put a favourable comment in. Actually, I like the angry comments because I'll fire up back at them. It's good fun. <laughs> right, mate, thanks to all the bloody partners who I love as well because they've subscribed to us. Verify Investor Hub, DSI Underground, Spec Power and Technology, McMahon Mining Title Services, Anytime Exploration Services, KCA Site Services, Brooks Airways and K-Drill. Hooteroo, money miners. Money miners and you money miners information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.